I'm going to talk today about energy and climate. And that might seem a bit surprising because my full-time work at the foundation is mostly about vaccines and seeds, about the things that we need to invent and deliver to help the poorest two billion live better lives. But energy and climate are extremely important to these people. In fact, more important than to anyone else on the planet. The climate getting worse means that many years their crops won't grow. There'll be too much rain, not enough rain. Uh, things will change in ways that their fragile environment simply can't support. And that leads to starvation, leads to uncertainty, it leads to unrest. So the, the climate changes will be terrible for them. Also, the price of energy is very important to them. In fact, if you could pick just one thing to lower the price of, reduce poverty, by far you pick energy. Now the price of energy has come down over time. Uh, really, uh, advanced civilization uh, is based on advances in, in energy. The coal revolution fueled the Industrial Revolution, and even in the 1900s, we've seen a very rapid decline in the price of electricity. And that's why we have refrigerators, air conditioning. You can make uh, modern materials and do so many things. And so we're in a wonderful situation with uh, electricity in the rich world. But as we make it cheaper, and let's say, let's go for making it uh, twice as cheap, we need to meet a new constraint. And that constraint has to do with CO2. CO2 is warming the planet. And the equation on CO2 is actually a, a very straightforward one. If you sum up the CO2 that gets emitted, that leads to a temperature increase. And that temperature increase leads to some very negative effects. The effects on the weather, um, perhaps worse, the indirect effects in that uh, the natural ecosystems can't adjust to these rapid changes, and so you get ecosystem collapses. Now, the exact amount of how you map from a, a certain increase in CO2 to what temperature will be and where the positive feedbacks are, there's some uncertainty there, but not very much. And there's certainly uncertainty about how bad those effects will be, but they will be extremely bad. I asked the top scientists in this several times, do we really have to get down to near zero? Can't we just you know, cut it in half or a quarter? And the answer is that until we get near to zero, the temperature will continue to rise. And so that's, that's a big challenge. It's very different than saying you know, we're a 12 foot high truck trying to get under a 10 foot bridge and we can just sort of squeeze under. This is something that has to get to zero. Now we put out a lot of carbon dioxide every year, uh, over 26 billion tons. Uh, for each American, it's about 20 tons. Uh, for people in poor countries, it's less than one ton. It's an average of about five tons for everyone on the planet. And somehow we have to make changes that will bring that down to zero. It's been constantly going up. It's only various economic changes that have even flattened it at all. So we have to go from rapidly rising to falling and falling all the way to zero. This equation has four factors, a little bit of multiplication. So you've got a thing on the left, CO2, you want to get to zero. And that's going to be based on the number of people, the services each person's using on average, the energy on average for each service, and the CO2 being put out per unit of energy. So let's look at each one of these and see how we can get this down to zero. Uh, probably one of these numbers is going to have to get pretty near to zero. Uh, that's back to my high school algebra. But let's, let's take a look, people. Uh, first, we've got population. Uh, the world today has 6.8 billion people. That's headed up to about 9 billion. Now, if we do a really great job on new vaccines, health care, reproductive health services, we can lower that by perhaps 10 or 15%. But there we see an increase of uh, about 1.3. The second factor is the services we use. This encompasses everything. The food we eat, clothing, TV, uh, heating. These are very good things. Uh, getting rid of poverty means providing these services to almost everyone on the planet. And it's a great thing uh, for this number to go up. 
In the rich world, perhaps the top one billion, we probably could cut back and use less. But every year, this number on average is going to go up. And so overall, that will more than double the services delivered per person. Here we have a very basic service. Do you have lighting in your house to be able to read your homework? And in fact, these kids don't, so they're going out and reading their schoolwork under the street lights. Now, efficiency, E, the energy for each service, here, finally, we have some good news. We have something that's not going on. Through various inventions and new ways of doing lighting, uh, through uh, different types of cars, uh, different ways of building buildings, there are a lot of services where you can bring the energy for that service down quite substantially. Some individual services even bring it down by 90%. There are other services like how we make fertilizer, or how we do air transport, where the rooms for improvement are far, far less. And so overall here, if we're optimistic, we may get a reduction of a, a factor of three to even perhaps a factor of six. But for these first three factors now, we've gone from 26 billion to at best uh, maybe 13 billion tons. And that just won't cut it. So let's look at this fourth factor. Uh, this is going to be a key one. And this is the amount of CO2 put out for each unit of energy. And so the question is, can you actually get that to zero? Uh, if you burn coal, no. Uh, if you burn natural gas, no. Almost every way we make electricity today, uh, except uh, for the emerging renewables and nuclear, uh, puts out CO2. And so what we're going to have to do at a global scale is create a new system. And so we need energy miracles. Now when I use the term miracle, I don't mean something that's impossible. You know, the, the microprocessor is a miracle. The personal computer is a miracle. Uh, the internet and services are a miracle. So the people here have participated in the creation of many miracles. Usually we don't have a deadline where you have to get the miracle by a certain date. Usually you just kind of stand by and some come along, some don't. This is a case where we actually have to drive at full speed and get a miracle in a, a pretty tight timeline. Now I thought, how could I really capture this? Is there some kind of natural illustration, some demonstration that would grab people's imagination here? I thought back to a year ago when I brought mosquitoes and somehow uh, people enjoyed that. Uh, it, it really got them involved in the idea of, uh, you know, other people who live with mosquitoes. So with energy, I like to come up with is this. Uh, I decided that releasing fireflies would be my uh, contribution to the environment here this year. So here we have uh, some natural fireflies. I'm told they don't bite. In fact, they might even not even leave that jar. Uh, now there's all sorts of gimmicky solutions like that one, uh, but they don't really add up to much. We need solutions, either one or several, that have unbelievable scale and unbelievable reliability. And although there's many directions of people seeking, I really only see five that can achieve the big numbers. I've left out tide, geothermal, fusion, biofuels. Those may make some contribution, and if they can do better than I expect, so much the better. But my key point here is that we're going to have to work on each of these five. And we can't give up any of them uh, because they, they look daunting, because they all have significant challenges. Uh, let's look first at the burning fossil fuels, either uh, burning coal or burning natural gas. What you need to do there yeah, seems like it might be simple, but it's not. And that's to take all the CO2 after you burn it, going out the flue, pressurize it, create a liquid, put it somewhere and hope it stays there. Now we have some pilot things that do this at the 60 to 80 percent level, but getting up to that full percentage, that would be very tricky, and agreeing on where these CO2 quantities should be put will be hard. But the toughest one here is this long-term issue. Who's going to be sure? Who's going to guarantee uh, something that is literally billions of times larger than any type of waste you think of in, in terms of nuclear or other things. This is a lot of volume. So that's the top one. Next would be nuclear. It also has three big problems. 
cost, particularly in highly regulated countries, is high. The issue of the safety, really feeling good about nothing can go wrong, that even though you have these human operators, that the fuel doesn't get used for weapons. And then where, what do you do with the waste? And although it's not very large, uh, there are a lot of concerns about that. People need to feel good about it. So three very tough problems uh, that might be uh, solvable and so should be worked on. The last three of the five I've grouped together. Uh, these are what people often refer to as the renewable sources. And they actually, although it's great they don't require fuel, they have some disadvantages. One is that the density of energy gathered in these technologies is dramatically less than a power plant. This is energy farming. So you're talking about many square miles, thousands of times more area than, than you think of as a normal energy plant. Also, these are intermittent sources. Uh, the sun doesn't shine all day, it doesn't shine every day, and likewise the wind doesn't blow all the time. And so if you depend on these sources, you have to have some way of getting energy during those time periods that it's not available. So we've got big cost challenges here. Uh, we have transmission challenges. For example, say this energy source is outside your country, uh, you not only need the technology, but you have to uh, deal with the risk of the energy coming from elsewhere. And finally, this storage problem. And to dimensionalize this, I went through and looked at all the types of batteries that get made for cars, for computers, for phones, for flashlights, for everything, and compared that to the amount of electrical energy the world uses. And what I found is that all the batteries we make now could store less than 10 minutes of all the energy. And so in fact, we need a big breakthrough here, something that's going to be a factor of 100 better than the approaches we have now. It's not, it's not impossible, but it's not a very easy thing. Now this shows up when you try to get the the intermittent source to be above, say, 20 to 30 percent of what you're using. If you're counting on it for 100 percent, you need a, an incredible miracle battery. Now, how are we going to go forward on this? What's, what's the right approach? Is it a Van Hat project? What's the, the thing that can get us there? Well, we need lots of companies uh, working on this. Hundreds. In each of these five paths, we need at least 100 people. And a lot of them you look at and say, they're crazy. Uh, that's good. And I think here in the TED group, we have many people uh, who are already pursuing this. Um, Bill Gross has several companies, including one called eSolar, that has some great solar thermal technology. Uh, Vinod Kolsa is investing in dozens of companies uh, that are doing great things and have uh, interesting possibilities. And I'm, I'm trying to help back that. Uh, Nathan Merkel and I actually are backing a, a company that perhaps surprisingly is actually taking the nuclear approach. Uh, there are some innovations in nuclear, modular, liquid, uh, and innovation really stopped in this industry quite some time ago. So the idea that there's some good ideas laying around uh, is not all that surprising. The idea of tenor power is that instead of burning the part of uranium, the 1%, the U-235, we decided, well, let's burn the 99%, the U-238. It is kind of a crazy idea. In fact, people have talked about it for a long time, but they could never simulate properly whether it would work or not. And so it's through the advent of modern supercomputers that now you can simulate and see that, yes, with the right materials approach, uh, this uh, looks like it would work. And because you're bringing that 99%, uh, you have uh, greatly improved cost uh, profile, you actually burn up the waste, and you can actually use as fuel all the leftover waste from today's reactors. And so instead of worrying about them, you just take that, it's a great thing. It breeds this uranium as it goes along, so it's kind of like the candle, you can see it's, it's a log there, often referred to as a traveling wave reactor. In terms of fuel, uh, this really solves the problem. I've got a picture here of a place in Kentucky this is the leftover, the 99% where they've taken out the part they were now, so it's called depleted uranium. That would power the U.S. for hundreds of years. And simply by filtering seawater in an inexpensive process, you'd have enough fuel for the entire lifetime of the rest of the planet. So, you know, it's got lots, lots of challenges ahead, but it is an example 
of the many hundreds and hundreds of ideas that we need to move forward. So let's think, how should we measure ourselves? What should our report card uh, look like? Well, let's go out to where we really need to get and, and then uh, look at the intermediate. For 2050, you've heard many people talk about this 80% reduction. That really is very important that we get there. And that 20% will be used up by things going on in poor countries, still some agriculture. Uh, hopefully we will have cleaned up uh, forestry, cement. Uh, so to get to that 80%, the developed countries, including countries like China, will have had to switch their electric, electricity generation altogether. Uh, so the other great is, are we deploying this zero emission technology uh, we deployed it in all the developed countries and we're in the process of, of getting it out elsewhere. That's super important. That's a key element of making that report card. So backing up from there, what should the 2020 report card look like? Well, it, again, it should have the two elements. Uh, we should go through these efficiency measures to start getting reductions. The less we emit, the less that sum will be of CO2 and therefore the less the temperature. But in some ways, the grade we get there, doing things that don't get us all the way to the big reductions, is only equally or maybe even slightly less important than the other, which is the pace of innovation on these breakthroughs. These breakthroughs, we need to move those at full speed. And we can measure that in terms of companies, pilot projects, regulatory things that have been changed. There's a lot of great books that have been written about this, the outdoor book, Our Choice, and the David Mackay book, Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air. They really go through it and I think can create a, a framework that this can be discussed broadly because we need broad backing for this. Uh, there's a lot that has to come together. So this is a wish. It's a very concrete wish that we invent this technology. If you gave me only one wish for the next 50 years, I could pick who's president, I could pick a vaccine, which is something I love, or I could pick that this thing that's half the cost with no CO2 gets invented, this is the wish I would pick. This is the one with the greatest impact. If we don't get this wish, the division between the people who think short-term and long-term will be terrible, between the US and China, between poor countries and rich, and most of all, the lives of those two billion will be far worse. So what do we have to do? What am I appealing uh, to you to uh, step forward and, and drive? We need to, to go for more research funding. You know, when countries get together at places like Copenhagen, they shouldn't just discuss the CO2, they should discuss this innovation agenda, and you'd be stunned at the ridiculously low levels of spending on these innovative approaches. We need, do need the market incentives, CO2 tax, cap and trade, something that gets that price signal out there. We need to get the message out. We need to have this dialogue be a more rational, more understandable dialogue uh, including the steps that the government takes. This is an important wish, but it is one I think we can achieve. Thank you.
that's not good. So if you have very, very cheap fuel that you can put 60 years in, just think of it as a log, put it down and not have those same complexities, and it just sits there and burns for the 60 years, uh, and, and then it's done. It's a, it's a nuclear power plant, it's its own waste disposal solution. Yeah, well what happens with waste, you can, you can let it sit there, uh, there's a lot less waste under this approach. Uh, then you can actually take that and put it into another one and burn that. And, and we start off actually by taking the waste that exists today that's sitting in these cooling pools or dry casting by reactors. That's our fuel to begin with. So the thing that's been a problem from those reactors is actually what gets fed into ours. And you're reducing the volume of the waste quite dramatically as you're going through this process. I mean, you're talking to different people around the world about the possibilities here. Where, where is their most interest in actually doing something with this? Well, we haven't uh, picked a particular place, but uh, and there's all these uh, interesting disclosure rules uh, about anything that's called nuclear. Uh, so we, we, we've got a lot of interest. Uh, the people from the company have been in Russia, India, China. I've been back seeing the Secretary of Energy here talking about how this uh, fits into the, the energy agenda. So I'm optimistic. Uh, you know, the French and Japanese have done some work. This is a, a variant on something that has been done. It's an important advance, but it's like a fast reactor, and a lot of com countries have built them. So anybody who's done a fast reactor is a candidate to, to be where the first one gets built. So in, in your mind, um, time scale and likelihood of actually taking something like this live? Well, we need for one of these high-scale electric, electrical generation things that's very cheap, we have 20 years to invent and then 20 years to deploy. That's sort of the deadline that the environment models, environmental models have, have, have shown us that we have to meet. And, you know, Terran Power, if things go well, uh, which is wishing for a lot, could easily meet that. And there are, uh, fortunately now, dozens of companies, we need to be hundreds, who likewise, if their science goes well, if the funding for their plant, pilot plants goes well, that they, they can compete for this. And it's best if multiple succeed, because then you can use a mix, a mix of these things. We certainly need one to succeed. I mean, in terms of big scale possible game changers, this is the biggest that you're aware of out there? An energy breakthrough is the the most important thing. It would have been even without the environmental constraint, but the environmental constraint just makes that so much, uh, so much greater. In the nuclear space, there are other innovators. Uh, you know, we don't know their work as well as we know this one, but the modular people, uh, that's a different approach. There's a liquid type reactor, which seems a little hard, but maybe they say that about us. Uh, and so there, there are different ones, but the, the beauty of this is that molecule of uranium has a million times as much energy as a molecule of, say, coal. And so, if you can deal with the negatives, which are essentially the radiation, the footprint and cost, the potential in terms of effect on land and various things, is in almost any class of its own. Hmm. If this doesn't work, um then what? Do we have to start taking emergency measures to try and keep the temperature of the Earth stable? Yeah, if you get into that situation, it's like if you're, you've been overeating and you're about to have a heart attack, you know, then, then, then where you go, you may need heart surgery or something. There is a line of research on what's called geoengineering, which are various techniques that would delay the heating to bias 20 or 30 years to get our act together. And you hope, that's just an insurance policy, you hope you don't need to do that. Some people say you shouldn't even work on the insurance policy because it might make you lazy that you'll keep eating because you know heart surgery will be there to save you. I'm not sure that's wise given the importance of the problem, but uh, there's now the, the geoengineering discussion about should that be in the back pocket in case things happen faster or this innovation goes a lot slower than we expect. Climate skeptics. If you had um, a sentence or two to say to them, how, how might you persuade them that they're wrong? Well, unfortunately, the skeptics come in different camps. I mean, the ones who make scientific arguments are very few. You know, are they saying that there's negative feedback effects that have to do with clouds that offset things? There are very, very few things that they can even say, you know, there's a chance in a million of those things. 
The main problem we have here, it's kind of like AIDS. You make the mistake now and you pay for it a lot later. And so when you have all sorts of urgent problems, the idea of taking pain now that has to do with the gain later and a somewhat uncertain uh, pain thing. In fact, the IPCC report, you know, that that's not necessarily the worst case. And there are people in the original who look at IPCC and say, okay, you know, that, that isn't that big a deal. The fact is it's the, that uncertain part that should move us towards this. But my dream here is that if you can make it economic and meet the CO2 constraint, then the skeptics say, okay, I don't care that it doesn't put out CO2. I kind of wish it did put out CO2, but I guess I'll accept it because it's cheaper than right, right, right. what's come before. <laughs> so, and so that would be your response to the, the, the view on non argument, that basically if you, if you spend all this energy trying to solve the CO2 problem, it's going to take away all your other goals of trying to rid the world of poverty and malaria and so forth. It's, 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 a, it's a stupid waste of the Earth's resources to put money towards that when there are better things we can do. Yeah, well, the actual spending on the R&D piece, uh, you know, say the US should spend 10 billion a year more than it is right now, it's not that dramatic. It shouldn't take away from other things. The thing you get into big money on, and this reasonable people can disagree, is when you have something that's not economic and you're trying to fund that, that to me mostly is a waste. Unless you're very close and you're just funding the learning curve and it's going to get very cheap, I believe we should try more uh, things that have the potential to be far less expensive. If the trade-off you get into is let's make energy super, super uh, expensive, then the rich can afford that. I mean, all of us here could pay five times as much for our energy and not change our lifestyle. The disaster is for that two billion. And even Longborg has changed. Uh, his stick now is why isn't the R&D uh, getting more discussed? He he still because of his earlier stuff sort of associated with the skeptic camp, but he's realized that's that's a pretty lonely camp, and and so uh, he's making the R&D point, and and so there is a a, a thread of something that. Uh, I think it's appropriate. The R&D piece, it, it's crazy how little it's funded. Well, Bill, I suspect I, I speak on behalf of most people here uh, to say I really hope your wish comes true. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, okay so, uh, we just turn it. Did we, did we finish at like six-ish? Is that right? Seven. Okay, well, uh, okay, then maybe let's, let's take like a 10 minute break and let's absorb what he said. Now, when we come back, let's talk about uh, Bjorn Lumberg, who that was the discussion at the end there. And I want to, uh, you know, and, and Bjorn Lumberg, by the way, wrote the book, The Skeptical Environmentalist. Uh, I think he's, he's, a, he's kind of a really important figure. Uh, and uh, probably a major theme that Paul and I want to convey is actually be skeptical. Don't believe any kind of hype. So maybe when we come back, let's, let's, uh, let's tear into Bill. Anything positive we can say, sure, but maybe do the negative things. Okay, so 10 minutes, come back. Yeah, sure. yeah. As we're going. Uh, I think that, well, let's get to the Bill Gates uh, issue uh, first, and then I kind of want to show some quick slides about the, the assignments that I want you guys to think think about. Your, your assignments are not, um, it doesn't have to be MoMA quality by tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, but, but it is a kind of, it is a, it, in any medium that you feel comfortable in, whether it's writing, whether it's a, you know, a, a quick video, whether it's some kind of an image or signage, a phrase, a term, it doesn't really matter as long as you get to something that on an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, right, you, you kind of, well, except the sound pieces, right, uh, you, kind of, you kind of get through this, 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 this massive message, the kind of one wish similar to the one wish, wish message that Bill Gates was promoting, it's, it's your wish. And, and you, you have a, a lot of latitude, uh, like I said before. So you, if it, it can almost be fantasy, not, not quite, but I certainly think it could be almost any possible uh, technology or, or um, return to nature issue or a thought you might have. Can so, we do something up on Photoshop and just bring in a flash drive rather than anything? Yeah, yeah. It's it's actually, better. it's probably better. I, I don't know how sophisticated your, your capabilities are here. I was exp I'm lowest common denominator. Normally, my students get you know they get a, a, a couple of weeks to do it, and then they redo it. And I've got a whole host of them. They're they're, they're really hilarious. I'm going to show some uh, now that are sort of well, well here. Well, I might as well show them before you pop. Do we have a day? So these are what? We have a day. 
it, tomorrow, uh, we'll, you know, let's say uh, by the end of uh, the class tomorrow or mid class tomorrow. So we'll, we'll break at seven. Homework. Right? That sucks. Well, you don't have to do it. You're not getting grades, so or you'll all get A's, right? So, uh, here, here's a here's a pretty good one. Okay. I thought, what? Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's pretty good. Uh, yeah. There was a, a professor, there's a lot of issues of getting tenure and stuff. And some professor get, uh, does brilliant research published everywhere, is, you know, a, a genius, I'll leave that person's name out, but constantly gets student evaluations back with a lot of nasty remarks. So and so is a curmudgeon, so and so never pays attention, blah, 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 blah. And so he was a, uh, or she, uh, was threatened by uh, the committee saying, guess what, we're going to fire you if you continue to get another series of bad recommendations from the students. And he said, don't do that. Don't you dare. Because uh, that, would, that would jeopardize academic integrity. And you don't want that happening. And they said, well, you know, it's just the truth. You're, you just don't get, a, you're clinically a, a moron. Uh, we need you to but, you know, reach out to students. And he says, fine, you're threatening my job. Watch what happens. I guarantee you'll have a 100% chain yield. And he did. He, when he got his student evaluations back in front of the, the, the committee, they were all perfect. I mean, it was as if Jesus was, you know, <laughs> saying our character. And you know, what he did is what, what happens when you lose academic integrity is you just you make you say to people, um, well, you all get A's. I'll give you all ponies. As they're taking the evaluations, he says, you're beautiful, you're geniuses, best class I've ever had. Right. Uh, in some cases, it's actually true. Uh, it gives him chocolate, whatever. And the whole semester, the whole time, that kind of discussion with the wave of new students. So he, basically, he came in with pom-poms, really didn't teach anything, but worked the students to just believing how great they are. And it was, it was, it was some, in some ways, it was okay. It was very, now he's completely affable and got you know, wonderful evaluations, but no real content. So sometimes it's okay to, to create a little tension and to and to kind of point out those that are not doing really work or not being critical. Okay, enough of that crap. Uh, so here, here's a here's a great example. Um, well, it's strange because people don't always see the same thing in this one. So what, just shout out or or when we go around the room, anyone want to say what what they see in this particular save the world image? Now it doesn't have to be an image that I would like you to make a positive image about save the world, but it could be an image that's that's about you know, the negative effects of X or Y. You know, it could be something that, that shows a massive detriment or kind of apocalyptic view. So that, that's also kind of convincing uh, when, it, when an image like this passes by on a New York City bus. And people go, oh my god, I never thought of that. Right? I mean, that that's, I've got to, you know, now I'm reminded. Uh, uh, so, so what do you guys see in this one? Don't the water. Dumping crab in water. Yeah. So the river is like a sewer. Well, what what is what is that thing that's doing the dumping? Paint can. Paint can. Paint can. Anyone see anything different? Paint can. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. So what, what, what did you think it was? If it wasn't a paint can. Uh, I thought it was a sewer pipe. Yeah. Sewer, sewer pipe. Yes. Okay. It could also be an oil pipe. Well. Could be. Yeah. What about this one? What does that say? These are these are top notch people that produce these images. This is the no slack here. What, what uh, the, in the red? What do you, what do you see? Um, about about the oceans and like, fish dying, pH levels. That's good. What does that glove mean to you, though? The we're doing it. With what we're putting into the ocean. Okay. It's our hand. Okay, good. Well, what else, what else you guys? It's also trash picking itself up. Yeah. Trash picking itself up, very good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which it doesn't do. Yeah. And back to the. the but it's kind of acting as. It's also kind of corpse like at the same time. You know, sort of the village like a corpse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's got that Frankenstein yeah. you know, dismembered hand. Kind of frill, <coughs> Talks about like our obsession with safety and cleanliness, but then um, it's 
uh, That's right. Term bonus. You are now reading into it. Do you think that the the, the, the illustrator or the, 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 the advertisers thought about this? Probably. <laughs> I, I think they, they spent the, you know thousands of, of people hours yeah. finding the right glove. I also see a, an Ouroboros. So I, I don't find this exactly a lot of positive evidence from that. Mm -hmm. It's the snake eating itself. Cool. So this wasn't made by one of your students? No, no. This is not made by one of your students. It looks like that um, it's glitter uh, is also for the glove when we discussing the way she's Great, I know. It's great. It does say that. Like, yeah, the glove itself is disgusted by itself. Mm. It's all that's pro that's a reflection on us, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. we usually put them on because we don't want to get. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's great. It's great. Yeah. Okay. Oh, this one. Um, no, no. What do you guys see? You never put a rug in the wash. <laughs> What? Should it be dry cleaning your coat? Dry, dry cleaning your coat, okay. It's a great ad for dry cleaning. So. <laughs> Burr's dead. Come on, what do you guys see? It's a lot. What? Not like animal kills or um, coats. Okay, like killing animals with coats, yeah, it's a pretty good one. one. Something about that. The energy use. Energy use affects animals. Great. What, what were you going to say? I thought the chemical on the side, I don't know what that's got to do with Chemicals that. also, what, affect the animals? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so, coming out of there. So. Right. What, what, is it instant? What? In three seconds, do you get a lot of this energy? Yeah, like yeah. That? Right. Yeah. yeah. I think you get it, it's, it's just visceral, right? First thing is visceral, like the red socks, sort of, like, uh, intestine or, or blood. So it's just it's visceral right yeah. off the bat. And mm -hmm. of course you connect instantly the, the fur with clothing. Um, but of course then there's the face, which there is a face. Changes. Is it is it yeah. What about the face? It looks like the well yeah, it is. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean it, it takes, you know, something, you know, we would wear animal print or fur or leather or what, whatever, but it never has a face, <laughs> unless you're one of those old school people that actually are a fox right around your neck. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let me ask our, our, uh, one of our, our chief skeptics here, what, what, do you, what do you think this says as far as a society is concerned, because you made that criticism? What notes? It's just that consumerism destroys natural life, it just kills the environment. It's the washing machine, the cleaning liquid, everything you've got. Technology and death linked mm -hmm. together. Do you guys feel that this ad is, I mean, that's great. Do you guys feel that this ad is really corporate? Mm -hmm. Corporate. No. no. Well, actually, yes. All you have to do with that frame after that would be put in your washing machine that's eco friendly. Yeah, you just put right. a sticker on it, mm -hmm. and you can sell anything. Yeah, exactly. This could be easily be a corporate image. Mm -hmm. Like, just, just put text on it that flips it. That's 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 Brene. Okay. Well, does it does it look like PETA produced it or some action environmentalist group? They could. Do you think they could? No. They could, but it's not their preferred aesthetic. What? They could, but it's not often their preferred aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Well, what about the aesthetic? Uh, do you do you do you see in this image? I mean, tell tell me more about this aesthetic here that we're looking at. Well, this is the the the, the style that everybody's using. Because of that crappy photographer in New York, I can't remember his name. Uh, the American clothes company stole his style, and now it's everywhere. Where you take like a a typical vernacular photograph, and then you, and then you use that, you know, the, those visual cognates of bad lighting and stuff. La Chapelle? I don't know. I can't. I'm terrible with names, but it's. Yeah, that's, that's the aesthetic of it. It's very trendy these days. Yeah, anyone agree, disagree? Well, I agree. The lighting, I mean, a lot of advertising. Well, yeah, it's trendy. Kind of, I guess the lighting is more sort of naturalistic than you usually find ads a lot of more even. Ad busters? Yeah. Was this the
some of the photo? It's done in software. Done in software, yeah. Mm, a lot of things, actually. I, I think the cost for this thing is enormous. Well beyond any kind of grassroots organization like PETA to afford, necessarily. Not that PETA wouldn't embrace it, but I, I think that, to me, that there's, and this is a, my own critique, there's a gloss in here. It's so well done, so refined. Kind of like Avatar, again. You know, there's the Roger Dean, right? <laughs> and then there's the same shit, but with expensive computers. Right? But but uh, this this is an interesting message. It's hitting a lot of interesting Well, but it's also curious because the PETA people do actually, lots of people can use Photoshop and all that, but they choose not to use this aesthetic because it doesn't get the message across. Right, and, and PETA is more radical. PETA, PETA actually, if you've seen a typical PETA ad, They'll, they'll show the Holocaust with thousands of bodies piled up, you know, Jews in graves, dead, and then right next to it, a bunch of, uh, you know, the d dead meat from chickens, also piled up. I mean, they're, they, 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 they basically have no PC value. They're just, they're no correctness. They're going to say whatever they want. They are unbelievably adamant about people. I kind of, I actually support groups like that. Uh, okay, so here's another one. You guys see this one. Wait, the first one you showed us, you said that was one of your students, right? No, 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 I said my students have done tons of this. Okay. Yeah. I'm not going to show, I, I can show some of my students, yeah. I don't think I brought it in this hard drive. I, I got five, ten years of you know, versions. The best one is still the, the candy one. Well, this is, you know, this fantasy of Jewish people Fantasy of communion with nature. Okay, good. Interesting. With something that's normally a predator and has become this gentle. Mama bear. Yeah, it's yeah. like the ascribing human values to the bear rather than. Ascribing human values to the bear, okay? That's get, that's touching upon some things. What else are you going to say? Disney. <laughs> Disney. Yeah. Yeah. What? Disney? Yeah. Disney? Yeah, like animals and cartoons are always. That's interesting. That's right. It's interesting when you, I saw Oceans, right? Uh, that Disney film. It's, it's crazy how they declaw everything. Mm -hmm. Things are ripping each other apart, and yet I see no blood see, or actual violence. And this has claws, though. This has got big claws. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's very precious. So what do you mean it's right by saying Disney? It's what? what you, you said he was right by saying Disney. I didn't mean he was right. Well, I, 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 there's a kind of a, a Disney effect where where you would look at a bear like this and the thing is not scary. I mean, Disney just suddenly makes every bear gentle. I mean, Disney would never show a film where a bear eats a thing, which it would do. What, what do you think? This kind of makes me hungry. Kill <laughs> 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 a bear? Maybe. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I wonder what your, your solution is going to be. <laughs> okay, how about this one? We can turn the planet into Easter Island by chopping down all the trees and turning them into golf courses. Okay. <laughs> Easter Island. This is from Turkey, this ad. Oh, oh and these are all from Africa. Different play in France, Terry. I, I collect them. I, I wonder what's being. Is, did you remove the text? Or the text was below, or? Uh, some cases there there were. I, 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 these are my crops. You know this reminds me. Of, this reminds me of the kind of stuff I was talking about last night with Rapai, and how you don't sell the product; you sell the lizard brain instinct underneath. And so this is the lizard brain of dominance and uh, power. And this is saying. I can own this this violent device as a sporting object. You know, I can as if it's a baseball bat kind of thing. But it seems to me like it's not what it would sell, like it would prove why it's a problematic thing. Well, it depends on how it's how it's used, but I'm just thinking of the the because images are always ambivalent. Yeah, the text would change this, you know exactly. whatever, you know, if you were doing an ad for doctors and you were like showing the rugged like of 
rockers, even though you're tucking your polo shirt into them. And <laughs> polo shoes, you can Work. hold an axe and be a stud. Or you can, if you put text on it that was, you know, anti golf courses, it would <laughs> like show yeah, exactly. how ridiculous a golf course is. But I think the underlying engine, though, is the same thing I was talking about. Like, yeah. the high appeal to the lizard brain, bypass the language, use the language to take the emotion yeah. and then channel it. And so that's what I think we've been looking at. Okay, excellent. Uh, oh, Canada. Right, so you know, somebody's had a text. I think these are going to be a series of examples of kind of, there's no real photographic intent uh, per se, but just devices like this that exist and, and uh, bringing them to the foreground, surfacing them some level, almost without saying much. I and mean, this is in, this is Germany, actually. No, it's the Canada, it's the Canadian one. Yeah, yeah. I think it looks like the one in Canada. But, like but, but you know what they found out though is that these are not efficient. These are these suck. <laughs> no, they found that you use smaller ones because you use, you use little ones, and when one of them breaks down, because you see the, the the big tooth thing. Yeah, I can't use it. The, the, bu the bucket actually has teeth on it, and so when the tooth breaks, yeah. you have to stop. So if you have lots of little ones, you just stop that one. But with this one, you got to stop the whole one. What digs? It digs up car sands. Big digger. Uh, this is where your oil's coming from. Massive, massive scale. Uh, they do a number of things with big, heavy mining industries and can deploy something. I mean, it would be interesting to you know come up with that result. If you're the guy on the team that put all the money behind this, and ten years later you build it, so it's yeah, you do it small ones that are hand size. Yeah, they they learn from the hard way. Yeah, yeah they definitely learn the hard way. Right. So this this is I find these kind of egregious examples of you know, uh, I don't I put this one here. It's <laughs> <laughs> so the world's largest hot dog. This is one in China that's eighteen feet long. Long. Awesome. Uh, this is a pita ant. Right. for me there there I, and a lot of my car work and other projects is uh, kind of, you know, they, they used, in this case, supermodels to kind of sell ideas about flesh. I think uh, this also, kind of, I've been in this fight with car companies because, it, you know, there's this, someone told you, I don't know who it was, but someone told you that a, a, a shiny metal box is precious. It's a sports car. And that that's the thing to desire. A Lotus, uh, a, you know, a Ferrari like me, whatever they and it's, and it's as if we can't get out of that box. So our brains are geared towards that. Same thing with someone told you what beauty is for, let's say, the image of women. You know, which I'm, I won't discuss fully here, but the, I think the, the cars were, that we were designing were big, soft, and pillowy, kind of fun, jello-like, nerfy, nerf-like cars. But this, this kind of gets to the meat effect. And then, I think this is, this is a kind of, I think it's a file series, a good series about New York. For some reason, everyone always picks on my favorite city, and, and we use it to kind of explain this the, 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 that theory of eschatology, the kind of, that the end is near, it's an environmental ill. So this is from a, a movie, uh, Final Fantasy, which actually predates the, the falling of the 9-11 towers. So you can see in here that towers are actually gone, and those two big humps are partly from uh, that's the Empire State Building. Uh, you know, views of what could happen, and this was used in the 50s out of these catalogs through the nuclear holocaust. Uh, I don't think you'd ever see two bombs like that drop, but this... <laughs> oh no, you would. Actually, you would kidding. see a pattern of uh, nine. What you do is you use 20 kiloton yeah. weapons, and you put them in a pattern with one in the middle. And what it creates is you can use very small weapons to create uh, an amplified shock wave against each other. So a lot of small weapons in a precise pattern create a much larger explosion. Yeah. Uh, okay, anyway, go ahead. Let's get, let, let leak out. Um, well, that's why no, lots of awards have to be tip of the uh, intercontinent door. Uh, this, is, this is more meteorites. I think that was a, a funky one. It's good to be lovely big holes. Uh, other kind of uh, more popular films. See, films, um, I have a slight issue with films. They're, they're, they're not as, as as deep as statistics, but most people are not going to watch the Alan Moore film or mm -hmm. see a Bill Gates lecture where he's showing even in those absurdly simplified graphs and equations. That's just too abstract. So we go to films with you know uh, K 
Kevin Costner and he got Waterworld and some or you know some some idiot kind of showing that there's a big environmental calamity and they were going to freeze over or flood is going to come, right? Uh, the Statue of Liberty itself is a great symbol to communicate something. This was uh, um, I can't remember, remember the name of the movie, but you know we're always abusing the Statue of Liberty. This creature you know, eats it. Cloverfield or whatever. Was what? Cloverfield. Cloverfield. Right, yeah. It's pretty good. I actually kind of liked it. Yeah. But, you know, uh, Escape from New York, classic. Again, the Statue of Liberty. Uh, yeah, I don't know why Kurt Russell's grabbing the guy. <laughs> <laughs> Planet of the Apes. I mean, this is this is actually an image that is from my generation when I was young. This never went away. This version that you know, well, the apes were taking over, but the Statue of Liberty and sin that was incredibly powerful. Right? Uh, here's here's Statue of Liberty freezing. Right? <laughs> one of my, my favorite ones. Needs to say Twilight of Liberty. Yeah. It's extremely accurate, uh, you know, good for the voice. Um, and this, this one uh, may be a bit more controversial, but I kind of like it because of its, uh, its level of abstraction and what it, what it sort of achieves. Here, the, I guess the text is, 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 is important, but minimal enough. So it's also really what, what do you guys think about this one, actually? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it can almost, I mean, you can no, but it's important that it says for nature that the nature will be attacked every day. But I think that's, you know, I think that's explained in there. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it needs it to reframe it, otherwise it just doesn't love them. Well, yeah, and I think actually when I first looked at this, I almost dismissed it because right away I just assumed that those were the two towers, yeah, and I've seen that image so many yeah. times. Yeah. I just dismissed the image, but then I actually looked at the caption and I looked back and I realized they were trees. It's also the resolution. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that's true. Maybe if it was a single Well, no, because that's what the resolution is. That's what the original yeah. image was. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. All right, hold well, well, on. Well, well, before we get to single one, well, tell, tell us about resolution. Well, it's a, it allows us to focus and think. It allows us to see. It's it. lack of resolution allows us to focus. No. You think it has high resolution it or low resolution? It needs resolution for us to focus on the concept of combining 9 and 11. So yeah, I like some resolution. And therefore like we can cognate about like this content. Yeah. So, yeah. so wait, wait, hold on. It's not, it's not about the pixels that we're looking at. Because to me this looks like a, to me this looks like a, a TV screen. Yeah, yes. the sharpness. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, it, the problem is, it, it seems to what you captured it, it seems like you, you put that there. Uh, that was the original thing. I just, it just crops weirdly, so I, I put it back up. I think the I think the you know pixelation or the TV screen effect. Yeah. I mean, I don't think you need the words. I think the idea that you look at it and you assume that it's the two towers is part of the part of the power of it because you've seen that image again and again and again and you're just so oh yeah and then and then it's like you stop and look again and then and mm -hmm. it, it hits you because it's it's ingrained in you. It's in your body. You remember it. Remember the day. You remember, and then. Do you think in three seconds, if you're an average person sitting on a bus stop and just drove by a New York City bus, you would pick up what it's about? I think you might not see it the first time, but chances are you're going to see it a second time and a third time, and and you know the first time you you know you maybe you don't even want to look, you know, but well, then maybe you think. Why is that on a city bus? That's offensive, you know? And then and then you start to get angry because it's like that. Ah, what you're saying presumes sharpness. Presumes what we don't have here. No. I, I assume this was actually the way the original image was created because all the 9-11 pictures that you keep seeing are the recreations from the yeah. TV image. Exactly. So yes. all the 9-11 images are pixelated. Yeah. And I'm assuming they did. If you you are not going to tell us, is, was this is this just because you cropped it, or is this originally the way it was? No, it's originally pixelated. Right, so yeah. It's meant to be not so clear. You meant to not pick up the first second that are trees. Mm -hmm. okay. For me, it just seems like, like a banality. I mean, the image and the statement. I think. Well, of course, we're violent and aggressive against nature. I mean, and the image doesn't give me any. 
There's well, no I twist. Think, or I no. think when you see the yeah. twin towers, you see that other people did that to those structures. And then when you see this, you think, oh, you know, and instantly you think terrorists. And then you, you know, and then it's like, well, we're all, you know, complicit in what's happening in nature. So it, you have to think of, of well, your own role. Exactly. You it, says, it says, who's the terrorist? Yeah, you can't, you can't say it's the other that's doing it. You know, which is what we do with 9-11. It's the other. It's, it was done to us. I'm willing to bet, though, if you put this on a New York City bus, you get a whole lot of backlash. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. I, I want to say something which might be a little controversial. I actually like it because it takes away from the 9-11 photographs. Mm -hmm. Because that event, although maybe tragic, has been over-traumatized and overused mm -hmm. to such a magnificent attempt. Towers like that have been brought down around the world so many times. So many wars. In 1982, you had about five buildings drop a day. This, this, those images became so much like crucifix. Mm -hmm. So the more images that come out like this, the less likely that can be abused for something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I took a class on, uh, it's like a kind of a master class on uh, giving presentations. It was with the, um, the the outdoor group. Uh, I forgot what their names are, but they have a spoke called. <laughs> anyway, whatever. So uh, they, they told me things that you should not do. And so one thing is if you're going to give a, a set of statistics on poverty, uh, you know, give the statistics, but don't show, you know, some emaciated infant in the desert with flies around. That you will lose your kind of audience. And kind of the bigger point is be true to yourselves whenever you give any kind of talk. So there's a kind of Darth Vader and Smurfs story. You know, little blue creatures keeping their smarts. <laughs> so Darth Vader came into a room and wanted to sell people the Death Star. And the room turns out to be all Smurfs. Should Darth Vader dumb down his conversation and, and chill on his imagery of destruction of planets and the rebel forces and whatever else he's into and just kind of, you know, work the crap? Or should he just come in and um, choke every single one of them <laughs> and leave the room? I guess the answer is the latter. Just kind of be true to yourself, whatever it is, and if you have to be evocative, uh, and it's, it's part of who you are, then I think that's that's okay. So being PC is not always the case. These guys didn't want to do that. Actually, I think there's a, probably another layer. It's a kind of conspiracy thought that the environmental debate is just a big conspiracy, and it's similar to 9/11 that it actually is some kind of governmental conspiracy. Not, not that I'm subscribing to it, but we've all heard that maybe this is not possible. Mm -hmm. And to be direct, I, you know, I took architectural structures for years, and we had studied, my professor John Archie had studied the World Trade Center from the first explosions, and my instructions in my final exam uh, were about that it was impossible to knock down those towers with any kind of plane. So when I was watching those towers go down, I was telling my, uh, my roommate at Harvard that it's a fake, it's not possible to do it, because I've seen the numbers, planes are too lightweight, there's no way the fuel could cause this to fall. I, I just didn't believe it because I, I was told that. But it did, and I've since kind of been like, anyway, kind of a conspiracy theory. Anyway, these are the negative ones. So here's some of the positive ones. Um, this, well, this, this, is, this is more of a, an image for, for you guys. Uh, I, I, kind of, I kind of like the backstories to a lot of these things. And this is, this is a, a young architect, too. This is the guy, um, he looks like David Spade, but I, I guess he designed the recycling symbol. There he is with an old, uh, you know, drafting rule, and you know, the master architect, uh, kind of looking over him. You now that symbol is kind of propagated everywhere. So this is when it comes to kind of signage. I, I mean, if you didn't speak the language and you saw this sign, do you get it, or is it something that's learned? Obviously, it's, it's more learned, but still, this, the sign is provocative enough that if it does pass by a New York City bus, it does give you some kind of impulse. It does, it does bring up some serious questions. So, so, so semiotics is, is, is huge, and this is probably the best example uh, that was produced. Okay, what, uh, what do you guys see in this one? DMT is a wonderful drug. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. 
Propagation of the planet through space and time, and it's leading behind. It's almost like a trail of what was going towards what is or what will be. Silent running if they decided to not destroy the last ship. Silent running. Okay. The city, also a kind of hero, friend. It's kind of similar. Uh, but we, we've got many variations. Another colleague, Dixon Despommier, vertical, vertical farms. I don't know if you've seen this kind of uh, proposition, but growing skyscrapers filled with food. Uh, very interesting kind of architectural slash science agricultural proposal. Here's a kind of predates those the, the pre pre uh, I guess what, uh, preliminary the first stamps that kind of a future version where our orbiting space stations will create massive harvests because they're so close to sunlight and it'd be so easy to mechanize or automate the systems to get food all through hydroponics, etc. It's kind of super high-tech farms. What about, what about this one? And that, that's my crop, but um, what does this one say? Green is sexy. It's a sexy? Green is the green, yeah. Green is sexy? Yeah. What else? Is there a Betty Page kind of? No, I should have a <laughs> Yeah, well, there's, but it's like dominating the earth a bit, which is kind of very extreme. Do dominating yeah. because of her clothing? Or yeah. Yeah, she's yeah. getting in front of the earth. Well, so is that, is that a green? Perfect. Hold on, what? Is that a green position? I mean, the earth's not really. Did you do like a <laughs> What? Yeah, not really. I mean, but maybe like a way of us. Taking action to create the earth. Taking, take action. Well, how is she taking action? Like protecting? Yeah, yeah she's like, protecting. Like a superhero, a female superhero, like protecting the no. earth. Keep your hands off the liar. But she's in front of the same way she's in front of the Yeah, they don't lie about the earth. It is a female, as opposed to a man. What is it? Atlas, the guy who holds up the atlas, so it's a female now. Mm -hmm. So then it's progression. Okay. That's very good. Atlas shrugged, kind of thing. Whole Anne Rand play. Let's change it to a female. I mean, yeah, I, 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 I certainly buy that. It's like Mother Nature. Yes. Yeah, you got yeah, Mother Nature. Yeah. But a high club <laughs> version. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of Mother Nature. Uh, Capital sex. 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 <laughs> sex. So Mother Nature is sexy. And has a lot of sexual appeal. Okay, it's is Mother Nature sexy? sexy? It's like a tough Mother Nature. Tough Mother Nature? Yeah, Mother tough Nature. Like tough like stiletto tough? Mascara made out of petroleum products. It's a bad No, it's, it's all um, that it's fashion. Yeah, I think it's that now that it's really fashionable to have this uh, save the earth and this green um, behaviors of green. Labels and so on. Right, so green I is think the new black. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's uh, fashion. <laughs> is this, but you, you know, I didn't change the coloration of the cover of this issue. I mean, you, you notice that there's a, a sickening green filter on her mm -hmm. skin. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 So, oh, this is so it's just like she's more like a twisted leprechaun. You know, <laughs> well, this is nice dream photo I mean, you can see the, the way they wanted to make her hips look more narrow, so they, they actually trimmed her right leg. Moved it left, and to emphasize that they they do, they lightened up a certain section of her shadow right by her hip to make her hip look even more narrow. And like the Demi Moore photograph. Of that, no, this is all. I, I used to do this. This is all totally synthetic. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, no, I got made kind of money. Okay, so how does it make you feel? Let's hear one opinion from a guy. From, uh, what does it do to you? This issue came out, and I just was like, it, it, to me, it just was so, it was, it was off putting. Um, it, I thought it just seemed smug. Um, I thought she had no business being the, you know, this representative of 
of all this stuff. <laughs> the material girl. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. Just, <laughs> But it's Vanity Fair. And Vanity Fair is going to market to who you're not probably gonna buy nothing. You probably don't buy Vanity Fair, but the people who buy Vanity Fair are gonna like the Madonna material girl stuff. So you have to put someone on the cover. I actually like Vanity Fair. But um and I do I I do get it, but um I don't I these are the kinds of issues that I, I hate and they're ridiculous because when you open it thousand little pieces of paper fall out onto the ground that, you know, trying to get you to subscribe. And literally, there's probably six or seven of these slips. Like, how many times can you subscribe? But, um, yeah, it was just, it was so, it was such a strange um, choice, I thought, to put it on the cover. It, it, but a tree fell well, in Yeah. I kind of think, like, this is almost laughable to me, because there's, there's something really funny about the fact that she's trying to convince me to go green by being really sexy. It's like, I, you should go green and here's why. And it's, it just seems laughable. Like, it's just such yeah. a disconnect from, like, two separate issues. Why, though? Well, I almost think that's a I mean, sex sells everything, why not? So yeah. Well, but I, I think yeah, that's actually, sure. that, that is the sad affair. It's the fact that, the, although you might look at it and go, oh, this, this, is, you know, this is disturbing, it shouldn't be like that, it shouldn't be her trying to sell me this way, but that actually works. I, I mean, that magazine is that magazine because this crap does sell. It's funny though, like, honestly, I don't even see her. If I see that on a magazine rack, it's at a point that it's like, it's completely invisible to me. Because she's ubiquitous or an icon? Because this is not the kind of thing that actually attracts me. I'm looking at like, okay, what are the articles actually? Right. And I know this is always there. But it's just not, I just don't need to see it in the land, it's erased. And I, I, I can recognize it and discuss it and blah, blah, but like, personally, I just don't I, I didn't bring it, but there is another issue with uh, Foxy Brown, not on, not on this cover, but Foxy Brown, mostly naked, right? Uh, with, you know, her big fro. Uh, she's super hot, but, but, well, I maybe mean, from my perspective, she's got a giant shotgun, and uh, she's all rainbow colored, and her hair is the earth. And she says, Mother Nature is kind of tough effect. And I think that, that predates this image. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's more effective. You can probably find it online. But, uh, it's very, very, very cool. Uh, is that for Vanity Fair? What? That was for Vanity Fair? No, she, yeah. it, was, it was a Foxy Brown kind of thing. Was, you know, maybe it was, it was a branding for her. And she's all about you know, Mother Earth. And it's, you know, different, different subject. But I, I see Madonna is making her attempt to rebrand herself as green. Nowhere near as successful as the Foxy Brown attempt to re to position herself as green. Because she's got a leather jacket and a shotgun. So those are not considered green things, but the tough Mother Earth thing worked better. What are you saying? I just think it's weird too because Madonna is has causes, like she is known for causes, yep. but the environment isn't one I would really associate with her at all. It just seems like it misfires on a, on a weird basic level. Well, it's probably a designer who saw what you're yeah. talking about and well, tried to reuse it. But not effectively. Well, she's protecting Africa, so she can go get one of the things. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, can, I can see the, uh, the the guy sitting around, you know, a table with like empty caskets of Chinese food, and they're like, "So yeah, I got this idea. We're gonna like uh, put the world up, and uh, we we need somebody to like like be within the world. Uh, I want Charles that. No, Charles that was dead. So uh, I know we'll get Madonna. Madonna. Madonna will be great. You know, that, that's how all this stuff. Is Have you been there? Dude, I have been in so many of those meetings, don't even go there. <laughs> okay, here, here's a different one. Uh, what do you guys see in this one? P? Free? Free. Oh, free. 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 <laughs> hey, what'd you think? Free. P would be good. <laughs> Rainbows bother you? Rainbows bother me a little bit. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The pot of gold. It's what? what? The pot of gold. The pot of gold. There's Why nothing about nature that's free. What is that? It's cultivated. Nothing, nothing yeah. is free in nature. Huh. Hmm? What? what? Why do rainbows bother you? Um, I, I think that the, they fail in their associations. Uh, it's, it's a kind of a... It's a, it's, a, it's a big kind of utopian view or some, 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 something that's it's 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 been so reduced to kind of a children's, you know, kind of a, a directive, 
uh, or, or, a, or a fantasy directive or a, a, you know, a, a hippie kind of position. It's, it's, I, I, we've got to reinvent the rainbow. Well, I mean, it has been rebranded for you know, the, the, the gay flag. For, that's, that actually works. Um, down the software. For what? Downy software? Down the software. Oh, is it a rainbow? I don't know. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, the rainbow is, you know, I don't hate them. I'm not, yeah. you know, I'm not going to smash out all the rainbows. Hate unicorns too, don't you? And ponies. I bet you hate ponies. But, but, but if, I, if I was on the board of directors and we were making a decision on this, this image, I, I might say the rainbow, we could just remove it. Mm -hmm. And the, the image would, would be that. No, but then you have to crop it. Because, that, see, what the, the rainbow is activating the, the upper section. And so the light, your eye comes down and then sees that shadow. Yeah, you have to recrop it. You have yeah, to you have to totally recrop the image, yeah. But I think actually there's a, a kind of a, a tension that's, that's a, a more of a force negative because your, your eye's moving back and forth between yeah, yeah, drawing yeah. and drawing yeah. to the rainbow. I this green, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Anyone know what this one is? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. No, that's the Simpsons dome from the movie. Yes. Oh, right, right, right. But specifically what dome? Who put the dome? Uh, fuck me, <coughs> Uh, well, yeah, he did the dome thing, but for the in the Simpsons movie, who put the dome over uh, Springfield? Well, we got Schwarzenegger. Oh, um, Schwarzenegger? Yeah. Well, no, no it's, it's the owner of the plant. It yeah. was the. No, it's not uh, Mr. Burns. You know, remember, it was the EPA. Well, After Homer polluted uh, the stream so much with with, with pig shit. Or spider pig, I'm forget. Anyway, but, uh, it's the EPA solution. Just cap the whole thing. So you know what I like about this? Uh, I have another project. I run a bunch of studios called Ecotarian. Some other projects. We're rethinking the American prison, which is a, a huge topic. And one kind of prison I had is is, probably, is the worst kind of prison for the worst kind of criminal. That's the kind of the white collar criminal. Uh, and I think that they should go to a prison that's a dome, just like Biosphere Two with Polly Shore, <laughs> and they're, they're, they're stuck inside this atmosphere with very limited supply of oxygen, right, and a certain amount of plants and creatures to eat and feed themselves in the Krebs cycle to keep the oxygen and CO2 moving, and that any offsetting of that equilibrium will cause a, a potential disaster and be a food shortage, and these prisoners would die off. So these guys, they're, and to be truthful, they're mostly men would have to work together in harmony to keep their biosphere alive and learn that everything is precious and everything counts and, and that their urine doesn't go away. Their away has gone away, right? That's Gertrude Stein. There's no such thing as throwing something away. But it would only be prison if you put Polly Shore in there, too. <laughs> Polly Shore is definitely going in. He's the warden. What do you think your survival rate is? Adam Park is certain that the What do you think your survival rate is? Wait, say it a lot. What do you think your survival rate would be? With these guys? Yeah. That's my point. I don't think they would survive. <laughs> the, the toughest thing is to give them a chance. Deprivation. <laughs> deprivation? The sensory deprivation prisons are what we use for the coolest criminals and the worst criminals. Yeah, that's really, that's cool. Well, actually it would fail, just, it would always fail just because of uh, complexity issues. Uh, that's why biospheres always fail. Something something goes wrong well, and they don't have any control over okay, it. So, it out. so the Biosphere 2 project was one of these fantasy projects that you've been given. It was actually no holds barred, unlimited budget, all the scientists you could possibly pack into a room, and, and all the space you would need to create a piece of the earth Right, recreate it in a hermetically sealed condition and see if you can capture our atmosphere for a one-year cycle. Can we do it? Do we have the technology? That, that was an excellent thought experiment. It was kind of an excellent uh, reified, completed experiment. And it did fail. The, the bionauts that were in there, there were many issues. Uh, probably the big issue came from the advertisers. Some joker decided that one of the bionauts, one of these eight scientists, had to be extremely attractive press. Put that, you know, woman in there with, uh, you know, never mind, but there, there was a lot of tension created from that, uh, and that didn't really work so well, and I, I thought that you should maybe pick folks on their merits, but that was actually important. They needed a face to sell this goddamn project, so, so uh, and, you know, and she was a legitimate scientist, and don't worry on this, but anyway, the project, project uh, to me was a success because it was built, but it represents uh, a, a kind of a mark 
that we can't just terraform the moon or Jupiter because we can't do it in Arizona. We can't get the goddamn thing to work on the Earth with all the money you can imagine. How are we going to get it to work someplace else? And how important is it to really think about this kind of feat of geoengineering? Right? This, is, this would be a feat of geoengineering. Like just creating a sliver of the environment. Not that big. It was only, you know, I don't know, 15 acres more or less. Small. Different biotopes from tropical rainforests to deserts. And, and a lot of thought went into that. Right, I, I think this might be, as far as the images are concerned, this is the kind of the last, the last of the images. And then we should talk about Bill Gates and wrap up. Um, well, do you guys know this one? Yeah, I believe it's... What does this bring to you? Okay, thoughts. Now remember, this is the good news, the positive images. Well, this I'm linking this to the previous image with the uh, rainbow, because in the song, when you develop a film that's a musical, you always have what's called the I Wish song. And that's the first major song that is sung. And so it, what it does is it, it voices the aspirations of the lead character. So it's, it's called I Wish Song. And it's Disney, every Disney movie has it. And, it's, and this is one of the first movies that really codified it. So it's like somewhere over the rainbow, birds will fly. She's in black and white Kansas. She's imagining things over the colorful rainbow. And her wish is to go there. And so bingo, she goes here. What is there? What is that? What is the there that we're seeing? What? The Emerald City. The Emerald City is exactly right. That's what it's called. What is the Emerald City? Utopia. Doesn't exist. Utopia. What? It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. But it's green. What is utopia? Yeah. A fantasy. A fantasy. What? What? Like an ideal place. It's a An ideal. It's a projection. It's a place you can't get to. Is, does it have no value, or does it have value? Where are they? The funny thing is, this is part of like Disney's destruction of any political movement. Because when this book was originally written, the Wizard of Oz was supposed to be the president, and the Tin Men were supposed to be the steel workers, and um, the, the straw man was supposed to be the farmers who didn't have enough brains to mm -hmm. revolt against. And it was just, it was a, an economic fable about what was wrong because of censorship, and you can come out and say it. So it was created as a fable to kind of move people. And you come into Disney and you just kind of yeah. wipe that all out and maybe slap a nice little shiny symbol on it, and then it becomes completely meaningless and absurd. Yeah, was it well, I agree with everything up until where you say it becomes completely meaningless, but otherwise you're, you're spot on for a lot of things you were saying. Yeah, it was the defense of the gold standard. You follow the yellow brick road yeah. Yeah. to utopia. Yeah. Or he capitalism, was, right? Well, no, specifically the gold standard. He was a proponent of the gold standard, and he was decidedly against any kind of uh, move away from that. There was a move in the late 1890s to go to paper, to go to uh, fiat money, and it was roundly defeated. And the, the compromise was during Delano Roosevelt's uh, uh, regime where they codified it to a certain value for gold and you couldn't trade with it. But yeah, that's a minutia of history. I, I want to hear a few more comments on utopia, whatever you well, I mean, it's a place they all are going to get their dreams fulfilled, right? So it's like some place that could be a fulfillment of our dreams. So. But it's very, it's, imper no, it's very impersonal. It's like very, um, I mean, it's a city, but there's no, there's no people visible. 